Welcome, everybody. This is the seventh So Kwan Luck Distinguished Lectureship. That means this is the seventh time we've had the opportunity to come together as a community and listen to an outsider who brings something really special, something really valuable in addition to the community that we have here. That means this is also a seventh opportunity to thank So Kwan Luck himself, Mr. Kwan So, Kwan and Marion So, who have been enormously generous benefactors for this program. You know, we like to say that Kwan So had faith in the China program at UCSD, even before we had faith in ourselves. He always pushed us to grow and expand and reach out, and we're incredibly grateful to Kwan and Marion for the faith they've showed and the support they've given to the program. I think it's also especially appropriate that we have Francis Fukuyama here today. I could give you a long introduction of Francis Fukuyama. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you two things about him. The one little simple thing, his current position. He's a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University. And the second thing is, he's a genuine public intellectual. I know that's a word that gets used a lot, thrown around a lot, sometimes misused, overused. But by that I mean somebody who reaches deep into the body of collective wisdom that the world has developed over the millennia and yet also produces ideas and thoughts and insights that can reach out to millions of people and affect them and affect how they think and give them a deeper and more sophisticated interpretation of public affairs. We don't have very many public intellectuals in the United States today. We really, really need more of them. But Frank Fukuyama is certainly one of them. And Fukuyama has a special characteristic that makes him especially appropriate to be a Soquan Luck lecturer. And that is he's written a whole series of books. Most recently, this, this tremendous in-depth two-volume set on the development of political institutions. And into this deep work, China is integrated from the first word to the last. So there's actually a little section in the first volume that says, China first. Because he sees China as having I developed uh, an impartial state at an early stage of world history and then it fits into his overall concept of political development as involving the state, the rule of law, and institutions of accountability. And I just think in all of the work that gets done, everybody knows China's important. Of course, China's important. But to see work that really integrates China into the fundamental fabric of the thinking about social and political institutions, that's really rare and it's really precious. So it's a great honor for us to have Frank Fukuyama here today. Francis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. So uh, thanks very much for that really kind introduction, Barry. And thanks to Susan and uh, to the, the, the sponsors of this center. Uh, I feel quite abashed giving a lecture in a series on China because there is no, in no way, shape, or form am I an expert on China. Uh, but it's, I have been doing some thinking about some very practical issues related to uh, the way that the Chinese think about development, so I thought I would share that uh, with you today. Uh, so let's uh, move on. This uh, comes out of research I did with a couple of colleagues in the Stanford uh, School of Engineering whose background is primarily in civil engineering uh, and um, infrastructure finance. It's a, been a very uh, fruitful collaboration. Uh, many of these slides, actually, they helped write. Uh, so I cannot be blamed for those parts of the lecture. Uh, we'll see how, how it fits together. And as you'll see, we actually disagree slightly on how to interpret uh, some of the data that we've collected. But um, uh, I will go over that as we, um, as we proceed. 
So these are the origins of the study. Um, Western funding for development projects in developing countries has come to focus very heavily on only certain sectors, uh, primarily public health. In fact, massive spending over the last 15 years on public health. You have other issues like women's empowerment, support for civil society, a lot of work that I was quite involved in in support for good governance and anti-corruption. Uh, Infrastructure used to be central to everything that Western development agencies did back in the 1950s and 60s, but it's fallen out of favor in uh, recent years. Uh, the reasons for that are complicated. Uh, by the way, this lecture is going to be as much about Western policy as it is about China, because I think the contrast between the two is very uh, instructive. So, Part of the reason for this shift to public health is that's one of the few areas in development where there's actually a linear correlation between the amount of money you put into it and measurable results in terms of disease mitigation. So malaria, HIV, AIDS, all of these things can be shown to have, have produced actual positive, uh, positive results. And then the infrastructure has dropped out, I think, because of risk. Uh, essentially, there's lots of risks associated with doing a big dam or road project uh, in terms of dealing with you know, the different stakeholders. Environmental damage has become uh, an extremely important consideration. Uh, so that's been part of it. But the problem with this emphasis is that no country in history has ever gotten rich just by investing in public health and these other sorts of things that, that Western development institutions now uh, focus on. On the other hand, uh, infrastructure uh, is desperately needed, and there are many surveys of leaders of developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, especially when they're asked, what is it you need uh, in order to grow? They say, we need electricity, we need roads, we need you know, water, clean water, uh, and the like, and that's a need that's really not being met by uh, many Western agencies. China, uh, on the other hand, uh, does almost nothing but uh, infrastructure. Uh, they have emphasized that in their own domestic development, especially since the financial crisis in 2008 when they started to kickstart growth by reinvesting 50% of GDP. Uh, most of that was invested in their own infrastructure, and a lot of it has gone uh, overseas uh, as well, and if there's a distinctive Chinese approach to development, it is precisely this. You know, every country in East Asia has followed an, in, uh, an industrial policy uh, of one sort or another, some by emphasizing particular sectors. I think China's version of it uh, has been to build roads, bridges, airports, high-speed rail, uh, and, uh, and the like. Um, the United States, uh, by contrast, has gotten out of this business. Uh, we don't build infrastructure. I would say that this problem begins at home. We do not build infrastructure well in the United States. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers talks about an approximately $2 trillion deficit in infrastructure spending in the United States uh, itself. And I think the reasons for that are related to the reasons we don't do it in developing countries uh, either. And so the going in assumption uh, of this study was that a lot of it had to do with safeguards, that the cost of doing infrastructure uh, in the United States or by uh, Western influenced institutions had been driven up by the need to comply with a host of environmental, worker safety, you know, social consultation, a whole variety uh, of different safeguards that now accompany any big ambitious uh, infrastructure project. And so this project was designed in a sense to test this uh, and to see whether the Chinese approach, how it, how it differed and, and uh, whether there are things that either of us could learn from uh, the other. Um, and this is kind of independent of regime type uh, that our problem with, you know, with doing this was not uh, necessarily you know, the result, well, it, it could be related to the fact that China was an autocracy and we were a, a democracy, but that was a hypothesis that uh, needed to be uh, explored. 
Um, and finally, it does raise the question about whether our entire development uh, paradigm as it has emerged over the last uh, couple of decades really needs to be rethought in a fundamental way. All right, so that's the starting point. Uh, we work together with uh, some folks, as I said, in the engineering school. We had an early workshop on this subject where we invited most of the big experts that know about Chinese infrastructure uh, to a workshop at Stanford, and we commissioned large number of case studies. We also have a large database uh, of projects, both Western and Chinese, uh, in third countries. But this is an illustration, I think, of uh, what the trends are. All right, so this represents infrastructure spending um, on the part of the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. And the year of this chart is 2002. Uh, this compares those two Chinese banks with the World Bank, the IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the European uh, Development Bank, along with the IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And so uh, you can see that China at this point uh, was dwarfed by the collective lending of these other institutions. Uh, the next chart shows the year 2009 and how the Chinese share of total infrastructure spending has grown. This final chart, 2016. Now, this is a little bit misleading because the China Development Bank, this is all of the loan portfolio and 70% of that is actually being spent in China. And so if you actually want to get the proportion of it uh, that is spent overseas, it's only 30% of that very large area. But I would point out that actually a lot of the World Bank lending is actually also spent in China. And so not all of it is, is done in, in third countries. But the trend is unmistakable. You know, the Chinese in terms of uh, capital flows from development-oriented financial institutions has been growing and is really uh, at this point dwarfing the amount of money that's going from uh, that's going from Western ones. Now, the other thing to warn you about this chart is that this is only official aid flows. This is not private sector uh, investment. If you were to add private investment into developing countries, then you know all of these numbers look relatively small because you know Exxon Mobil and lots of com you know countries are investing in Nigeria and Angola and uh, places like this. So this really uh, represents kind of official development-oriented uh, uh, capital flows. All right, so in our study, we commissioned a lot of case studies. Uh, we, you know, we did the aggregate uh, numbers in terms of our database, but we also wanted to get more of the texture of the way that China dealt with uh, different countries. And what we were trying to do in our research design was actually to find a country in which uh, there's a Chinese project and a Western project, either World Bank, USAID, uh, you know, the DFID, the, the British Development Agency, and so forth. Uh, it turned out that's actually quite difficult, although we pulled it off in a couple of cases that I will, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but we, we did about 20 of them altogether. These are the ones that are completed at the present moment. Uh, and then we've got a bunch uh, that are, actually most of these are almost done, uh, and we will actually have them all up on our website, uh, you know, probably within about six months or so. So if you're actually interested in seeing any of these particular projects, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to uh, look at them. So... Overall, uh, if you look across the cases and, and the, the larger trends, uh, we see this growth of Chinese development uh, uh, financial flows. The, the, the growth is being driven really by these three separate factors, uh, which has to do with what we call authoritarian advantage, uh, strategic international competition, and then finally, domestic uh, industrial policy. So let me go over each of these. In terms of authoritarian uh, advantage, 
um, de democratic countries, when they do infrastructure, have to meet you know, a whole range of uh, safeguards, primarily having to do with environment, but also having to do with worker safety or worker rights, consultation with the various stakeholders. So if you do a dam project, you've got to relocate potentially thousands of people. You have to compensate them, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, and China obviously has a very different approach to this because it is authoritarian. Uh, the need for this kind of consultation you know, they, they is, is, is less important to them. Uh, you think about their own uh, domestic projects, the Three Gorges Dam, uh, when it was built, displaced about 1.3 million people out of the floodplain. They did this in, a, in 10 years. Uh, at that time, the largest hydro project anywhere in the world. We don't know what these negotiations with those 1.3 million people were, but believe me, it was not similar to the way it would happen if it took place in a uh, in a democratic, uh, in a democratic uh, country. Um, now, this is probably a better explanation for uh, domestic uh, uh, infrastructure projects than one that ones that take place uh, outside of uh, China, uh, because first of all, the Chinese do this in countries uh, that are democratic where they actually do have to observe safeguards. And one of the things we found in the, in the study is that where this is necessary, they will do it. So for example, they have bid on this high-speed rail project between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And uh, I think most of the participants in that project think that the Chinese will meet every American safeguard that's necessary. They, you know, they, they've, in, Part of the, this new span uh, in the Bay Bridge in, in the Bay Area, you know, it was made in China and it's made up to American standards. And so uh, it's not the case that the Chinese cannot make the, meet these safeguards. Uh, what you generally find is that if, you're, if they're operating in a developing country where the safeguards regime is more relaxed or the local government doesn't care that much about enforcement, they don't bother. Uh, because they allow, that allows them to do the project uh, more cheaply and more quickly. And in an infrastructure project, time is money. Uh, anything that delays one of these projects adds uh, enormously to costs, and that's one of the reasons why Western infrastructure projects end up uh, being, uh, going so far over budget, uh, virtually every one. The um, second driver uh, is obviously strategic advantage, that is to say foreign policy goals. So these infrastructure projects are not simply uh, uh, trying to promote development in, in, uh, in third countries. Uh, they also serve Chinese foreign policy aims. Um, they buy influence, they buy goodwill, presumably because China is supplying uh, goods that are really in demand, electricity, basic you know, services, uh, and the like. Uh, and there are many cases where it's very hard to see why the Chinese are investing in this project apart from these geopolitical uh, motives. For example, um, they're doing a high-speed rail uh, project across the Malay Peninsula in Malaysia, and it appears it's part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and it appears that the reason they're putting that in is to allow shippers to bypass the port of Singapore uh, because they can simply put containers on this rail and get it across the peninsula and then on you know, westward uh, after that. And so for whatever reason, you know, they, they seem to have this motive of wanting to take away uh, traffic from, from Singapore. Um, it is very hard to quantify or measure uh, the actual influence that China gets out of this kind of activity. Because certainly it meets the uh, desires of a lot of the leaders of developing countries in Africa, Latin America, other places. It's not clear that it actually buys China a lot of goodwill in many cases in terms of populations, precisely because a lot of times the safeguards are not met and so you get social protests at people being moved in order to make way for a Chinese project. You get a lot of resentment at the fact, you've probably heard that 
you know, China likes to use its own workers in many of these projects, and so there's complaints about the fact that uh, it's not generating uh, employment or technology transfer, uh, other things that people expect from this kind of infrastructure uh, project. It's not clear that China has developed any kinds of permanent uh, allies or, or clients as a result of this activity, but it still seems to be one of the three drivers. The final uh, issue really is domestic industrial policy. So as you're aware, there is a gigantic uh, domestic Chinese construction industry. There's a kind of construction industrial complex there. Some of the largest companies anywhere in the world are like China Harbor Engineering or the China Construction Company, which employ hundreds of thousands of workers, uh, have capitalizations in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And as China's domestic economy has begun to slow down, there's just a tremendous amount of unused capacity in China. And clearly, another of the drivers of this going out trend has been to employ these people, uh, to give work to the companies and to give work to the uh, individual workers that uh, uh, work for them. Um, one of the mysteries which maybe China Center can help us solve is to actually figure out how some of these decisions and the trade-offs are being made because the China Development Bank and the China XM Bank are not designed as loss leaders. They're not designed as aid institutions that are meant to serve either foreign policy or developmental aims. They're, they're actually profit, they're supposed to be profit-making uh, institutions. And it's you know, not clear when you've got a trade-off between one of these other goals like providing employment to Chinese workers or gaining strategic advantage, how that trade-off is made by the Chinese officials running these institutions because that's not actually a part of their job description. So let me go over some of the uh, specific cases that we've covered in this. As I said, you know, we're gonna end up with more than uh, 20 of these when the project is, is completed, but this will illustrate some of the tensions within uh, Chinese policy. So this is the one where our methodology actually worked. We actually did find uh, a single country in which there was a Western and a Chinese project uh, competing with one another. And basically it was a project to build a road uh, across the island of uh, Jamaica. Uh, it came in two phases. Phase one, uh, which began in 1999, was done by a Western uh, consortium led by the French uh, contractor Bouygues, uh, which began in 2001. Uh, they built the road. Like many of these projects, it ended up uh, facing engineering challenges. It was much more difficult to build the road than the initial estimate, the cost kept escalating. The contractor uh, completed phase one of this uh, project, uh, and then they looked at phase two, and they basically pulled out. They said, it's not going to generate enough revenue for us. We're not interested in uh, bidding on it. And um, at that point, uh, a Chinese group uh, entered the bidding with an unsolicited bid. Uh, they. Uh, offered to complete phase two of this uh, project based on a loan from the China uh, Development Bank and then promises of concessions along the right of way of this road uh, and so forth. Um, so this was directly a case where uh, a Western contractor did a very um, uh, straightforward cost benefit analysis and said we're not gonna make money off of this and the Chinese were willing to uh, step in. Um, So if you compare the Chinese and Western uh, approaches, um, Chinese actually offered to pay for the overruns actually in phase one of the project. So they were actually compensating uh, the French contractor simply to stay in the game. Uh, but it actually didn't work out well for them because phase two also had a lot of overruns uh, and they began to lose money. The road revenue, you know, the road traffic wasn't as high as they uh, initially projected. And in the end, the government of Jamaica said that this project could not be completed on a uh, commercial basis. And so essentially, the Chinese are going to lose money uh, on this project. But it appears from this that that's not the reason they got into this. It, it really did have to do with wanting to build influence in the Caribbean, 
It was a way of showing the flag in an area that had been traditionally you know, part of the American uh, sphere of influence. Um, I mean, this is a quote from the head of the French uh, firm. Uh, and um, this is the one from uh, the head of the China Harbor Engineering Company that was one of the subcontractors on this. Chinese were more interested in building a continuing relationship with the government of Jamaica uh, than they were on the single you know, calculation of whether they were going to make uh, money on the project. Uh, second uh, example is actually a more extreme uh, one, which has to do with the Democratic Republic of Congo. As you're probably aware, this is one of the most troubled countries anywhere in sub-Saharan Africa. At the moment, they're in the middle of a big political crisis because Joseph Kabila, their president, uh, is supposed to have stepped down several months ago and refuses to. And so the, um, you know, the whole country is, is kind of teetering on the brink of a renewed civil war. Uh, the Inga-3 hydropower project had actually been a Western idea, uh, initially going back all the way to the, the Belgians when they were the colonial power in the Congo. Um, it's a very uh, large project, uh, displacing 35,000 people in phase one and another 25,000 uh, in phase two. Uh, this was actually one of the favorite projects of Raj Shah, the Obama administration's um, administrator for USAID. He really wanted uh, the US to be able to do this. Uh, American agencies took a look at this. They did their due diligence and they said, no way, Jose, <laughs> uh, essentially, uh, because the DRC uh, was regarded as way too politically um, uh, unstable uh, to ever you know, guarantee the repayment. Obviously, they've got a lot of assets that they could use to repay, and that's why the Chinese were interested in this. Uh, they've got cobalt and copper and uranium and lots of other commodities, uh, but the calculation on the part of the American agencies was that this simply wouldn't work. Rod Shaw got very frustrated with this, among other things, because it was extremely difficult to come to any consensus within the US government, even on a negative result, but finally, uh, enough agencies vetoed it, and the United States pulled out, and then the World Bank did a similar analysis and said uh, it's way too risky politically. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, then bid uh, in the absence of, of, a, of a Western consortium. Uh, they actually had a couple of other bidders. Uh, there's a South Korean and a Spanish one, but the one that won is this Chinese consortium uh, led by Sin Hydro and Three Gorges, uh, Three Gorges Corporation, and they began the project. Um, so again, uh, this is a clear case where safeguards were such that the Western consortium just was not willing to go ahead. Political risk was way too high. Uh, the Chinese um, went ahead with it despite these risks that were pretty evident to everybody at the beginning. Um, this was part of the Chinese you know, desire, uh, especially in, in the first decade of the 2000s, to get access to raw materials, to commodities that the DRC uh, was producing. Um, it's not clear that this is actually going to go ahead. The only money that the World Bank supplied was a technical feasibility study, you know, a relatively small technical uh, feasibility study. Uh, and the Chinese are still saying that they're going to build this, uh, this very large dam. Um, and uh, as far as we can tell, that is the continuing uh, outcome. Uh, we'll have to see, but it's very, very unlikely that the Chinese are going to actually uh, make this deal work, uh, and they could lose uh, you know, a fair amount of money uh, on it. All right. The, Third project is actually an interesting one that's been in the papers quite a lot, which is this Harbor City project in Sri Lanka. Uh, and again, this is a case of, it, it's not, there's a couple of complex lessons that come out of this. One is that the Chinese uh, don't calculate political risk uh, terribly well. But secondly, that even if they fail in that calculation, it, it doesn't make a difference uh, because, of the, because of their approach. All right, so 
This was an integral part of the Belt and Road Project. Sri Lanka is one of the trade routes from Southeast Asia that is going to ship merchandise into the subcontinent, into the Middle East, you know, and thence uh, up to Europe. So it was very uh, important to them. Uh, it was going to require an investment of about $1.4 billion. Uh, so again, uh, Western countries uh, looked at the thing. They were willing to invest a couple hundred million, but not anything close to the $1.4 billion that was required to develop this um, uh, this port. Um, and by the way, all of this was done under the previous regime of the Rajapaksas, which if you know Sri Lanka's recent history were authoritarian uh, rulers that had prosecuted this war against the Tamil Tigers. They won it, uh, piling up lots and lots of human rights violations. So part of the reason that Western donors were extremely leery of getting involved was you know, because of that a human rights record on the part of the local government. The Chinese went in and signed the deal. Uh, and um, overall, they, uh, this was just one of several big infrastructure projects in Sri Lanka uh, that they had begun under the Rajapaksas. Uh, what happened was that there was a sudden election. To the surprise of everybody, uh, Siri Sena uh, won the election. The Rajapaksas were out of power. There was a transition back to a much more democratic um, Sri Lanka. And one of the first decisions of that new, more democratic government was they didn't want anything to do with this Chinese project. Uh, they felt that the Chinese had bribed uh, their way into, you know, into the contracts. They were becoming way too dependent on China. And so they wanted to stop. So um, this just goes over some of the uh, history, right? So this project, this particular harbor project had been signed before the end of the Civil War. Uh, in 2015 is when Siri Sena became the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, the project was suspended by the new government uh, and then there's a big negotiation over uh, how to resolve this because the Chinese had already put a lot of money into the project. Um, so again, these are some quotes that, uh, that indicate you know, how important Sri Lanka, not necessarily this project, but Sri Lanka in general was to the Chinese. And this is illustrated by this map, which shows you some of the other Chinese investments in this single uh, country. All right? uh, and then what the new government, the new more democratic government, found is that because of the accumulated debt from this whole series of projects that had been initiated under the previous authoritarian regime, they basically couldn't get out of it. That, uh, that canceling at this point would mean, you know, the, the Chinese uh, canceling these other, uh, these other projects as well. There's a lot of strong arming of them. And then, as you may have heard, I mean, these were the Western headlines uh, that came out about how basically the Sri Lankans were handing over this port to China. Now, the reality of this is a little bit different because this is actually not a working port. Uh, there are fears, some strategic fears, that the PLA Navy might eventually use Sri Lanka as a base, but we're years and years away from that right now. Uh, and in fact, just as a commercial deal, it's really not clear that this new harbor is, is going to make a, a whole lot of money. But it turns out that Despite the Sri Lankan government wanting to get out of this, uh, they were not able to. Okay, I'm going to give you one Western project by contrast, which is Power Africa. Power Africa was the headline initiative by the Obama administration. It was based on some surveys that indicated that actually a lot of African states did not want these health programs as much as they wanted electricity. Uh, that that was the single item that was you know, repeatedly stressed in, in their dealings with USAID and with the State Department uh, and so forth. And so on a visit to Tanzania, uh, President Obama needed a deliverable, and his deliverable was this thing called Power Africa. Um, it was supposed to generate 220,000 uh, megawatts uh, of new power. It was going to emphasize 
uh, alternative energy, not simply based on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and it had the backing of the president. So these kinds of initiatives in the US government are extremely hard to coordinate. About 12 agencies are necessary to make something like this work. This one, in contrast to some other aid initiatives, had the full backing of the President of the United States who was willing uh, to crack heads in order to make it happen. So what was the reality of Power Africa? Amount of money, new money that was put behind this project was zero, right? Obama's headline African infrastructure project, all of it was based on reprogram money that had been going to other AID projects. Uh, the big promise was, we'll, we'll help raise private sector money. Uh, and you know the, the program still exists because once you create a bureaucracy and task it to do something, they just keep doing it until someone tells them to stop. And no, I, I don't think the Trump administration has figured out that this thing is still going on. So you know, it, it's still plugging away, uh, but they've not delivered on any of the projects. And the other thing is that you know, it's fine to do alternative energy, and there's a lot of arguments that you know, certain places in the developing world can make better use of alternative energy because they've got a lot of sunlight and you know, hydro, I mean, geothermal and, and, and things like that. But the fact of the matter is that you cannot meet these ambitious um, uh, aggregate goals for electricity uh, unless you um, uh, depend on fossil fuels. And from the start of this project, we said we're not going to do any fossil fuel uh, projects, no natural gas and no uh, oil-fired plants. And so basically this project, you know, so the, the Chinese over the past decade have invested approximately 60 to 70 billion dollars in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is our response, uh, zero dollars, all right? So it's quite a, it's quite a contrast. Um, now, this, my colleagues uh, have a framework for thinking about the difference in approaches, uh, which, and, and they call the Western one transactional and the Chinese one relational. There's a long intellectual history to the use of these terms. Uh, I actually have a different way of thinking about it, which I'm going to run by you, which I think kind of makes clearer how it is that, that, that you know, the US government or the World Bank thinks about a project like this and how the Chinese think about it, all right? So if, uh, if let's say, the World Bank is looking at an ambitious infrastructure project, what they do is they look first at the internal rate of return. What the internal rate of return is, is what all business schools teach their students to do. They say, you estimate the future cash flows, you discount them to present value, and then you see whether those cash flows will make you a profit after you pay for interest and you know, salaries and, and cost of construction and all that sort of thing. It's a very straightforward uh, business calculation. Most infrastructure projects done anywhere in the world do not justify um, complete private sector funding because most of them will not make money. You can make money on airports, on toll roads, certain kinds of toll roads, uh, certainly on electricity and, and other kinds of utilities, but many infrastructure projects are really public goods, very hard to exclude people from using them, uh, and therefore, they, if you're just calculating the internal rate of return, uh, they're not gonna be done by a private sector uh, player, and that's why you have organizations like the International Finance Corporation or the World Bank or other aid agencies that then step in and say, well, because there are these external benefits to the project, to the society as a whole, that are not gonna be captured by the, you know, the contractors, we're gonna to top it off uh, and uh, we, will put some, uh, we will put some public money behind them. All right, that's, and again, that's why the IFC, the Exim, US Exim Bank uh, exists. Chinese approach, I think, is completely different and the mindset is very different. And so, of course, they calculate uh, the internal rates of return just like a Western uh, institution will, but they've got a completely different mindset about external rates of return. That is to say, all of the benefits that do not flow 
to the project participants, but to the broader society, right? So the economic growth that would occur as a result of this project that you know, will lead to the society as a whole getting uh, richer, even, even if you can't make money off of it. Uh, and they basically tremendously undervalue the negative externalities, that's to say things like environmental damage, uh, damage to the property rights of you know, the people that are affected by the project and so forth, and they greatly overvalue the positive uh, externalities. Now, when I was discussing this with my project um, associates, uh, one, of, one of them made the point that <coughs> he doesn't think that the Chinese actually uh, engage in, a, in an actual valuation of these uh, externalities. The World Bank does this all the time, right? So the World Bank, if it does one of these, uh, uh, let's say an energy project, will say, what is the cost of uh, removing the habitat of this particular kind of fish uh, you know, as a result of our building uh, a power plant in this location? Or what's the cost of moving this particular indigenous tribe from one area to another? And that will go into their final calculation about whether the project needs to be done. As far as we can tell, the Chinese definitely do the internal rate of return calculation, but they do not seem to actually do an external rate of, uh, of return calculation. Not a formal one, not in the way that Western uh, organizations do. If any of you China specialists know of cases where they have actually done this kind of evaluation, I'd love to hear about them. One of the interesting factoids that we came up with in doing this study was that the per capita uh, Chinese uh, spending on administrative personnel in their big development banks, the China Development Bank and the Exim Bank, was one-tenth the amount that the World Bank spent on its own administrative staff. Now, a lot of people immediately say, that just shows that the World Bank is bloated and wasting a lot of money on all these useless, uh, useless staffers. But another way of interpreting it is, what is, this, what is it that these staffers do? They do due diligence. You know, they look very carefully at these projects and they try to do accurate estimates of both the internal and external rates of return. And if you're only spending a tenth of the amount of money on uh, staff, you know, you're probably not doing an adequate job. And this, I think, is reflected in the number of these Chinese projects that have actually led to you know, fairly big uh, fairly big failures in terms of the economic viability uh, of those projects. Um, now, the problem is that if the Chinese estimate a certain external rate of return in China, they're the ones that get to benefit from it, right? So they put in a high-speed rail and it creates all this new economic activity, so they get, you know, possibility of more taxes and more economic growth and that's all good for them. Outside of China, they don't get to capture the external rate of return. If there are benefits to Pakistan or to, you know, uh, to Uganda, uh, it's the Ugandan government or the Pakistani government that's going to benefit from this, not China. So all of their benefits outside of the narrow project benefits have to come in terms of things like goodwill, strategic uh, advantage, uh, employment for their domestic workers, uh, and the like. And so it's not... You know, they're, they're proceeding as if they were doing these things as they did them in China, but under conditions where they really cannot uh, 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 reap the benefits. Uh, I just wanted to show you um, a few statistics about the Chinese high-speed rail system because I think that this illustrates this attitude towards externalities. So these are the most, I actually have a more detailed table on this, which I skipped, but these are the most recent um, figures on investment in this high-speed rail system. So as everybody, I think, in this room is probably aware, it's a marvel. It's one of the marvels of the modern world. 22,000 kilometers of track have been laid since the early 2000s on this system. Uh, you know, you see some of the comparison countries. That's 10 times as much as in France, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably seven, eight times as much as in Japan, uh, the United States, how much do we have? Zero, you know, again. Uh, but they paid a lot of money for this. Uh, it's really staggering. $850 billion cumulative uh, investment in this, uh, in this network. 
And what's very interesting is if you look at the debt ratios uh, for the liabilities of the railway ministry, you know, oversee for this project overseen by the railway ministry, uh, the debt ratio has been rising every single year uh, that this project has gone on. And if you actually look at the revenues from this system, they don't even begin to cover a tenth of the interest payments on uh, the debt. Now, why did the Chinese decide to do this? Well, obviously, they think that the externalities will justify this big money-losing operation in terms of the internal, uh, internal rate of return. Uh, and in fact, the history of this thing, uh, you know, the railway ministry has been described as one of the last bastions of central planning in the Chinese government where the government just decided to do something. They didn't consult with anybody. They didn't do a profit loss calculation. They just said, we need rail, and so you know, we're going to do it. It actually proved very resistant. They had to execute one of the <laughs> railway ministers for corruption you know, in order to get their attention because it was kind of a semi-autonomous agency. Uh, and among other things, you know, they've not been able to raise ticket prices on this network to you know, begin to raise some of the actual returns from this thing because Chinese consumers think that rail travel ought to be really cheap and the government ought to just pay for it. And so right from the beginning, this entire expensive network was regarded primarily as a, as a public good. It was not ex uh, expected to be um, a profit-making uh, operation. And I think that some of that mentality has carried over to other kinds of infrastructure projects that they've done, and it carries over into their general you know, approach to infrastructure in, uh, in developing uh, countries. All right? Um, so I think that both the West and China have to adjust uh, because neither of them is in the right place. And so there is a literature out there that says that the Chinese are using this uh, to expand their influence in negative ways for developing countries. I think that's wrong. I think that net, uh, you know, this is of advantage to, to developing countries. But in the long run, not meeting safeguards is not good for the receiving country because it means environmental damage, it means lack of sus political sustainability, and so forth. Uh, and so, um, on the other hand, for the West, I think that we are not the gold standard for doing these kinds of projects. We have too many safeguards. Uh, our projects are too expensive. And again, it reflects you know, the absence of infrastructure in the United States itself. Uh, the World Bank, in recognition of this over the last decade, has been trying to adjust uh, its safeguards regime to make them a little bit more flexible, to make these projects a little more doable. And I think this is an extremely important uh, agenda item. It's gotten a lot of pushback from a lot of international NGOs that you know, are the ones that pushed for the safeguards in the first place. But I think that you know, if the World Bank doesn't do these kinds of projects, uh, China will do them at a lower level of uh, social protection. On the Chinese side, this is uh, really pretty fascinating. Uh, the Chinese Export-Import Bank basically went bankrupt uh, uh, two, three years ago. And the, central, the Chinese Central Bank actually had to bail out uh, these two lending institutions to the tune of $90 billion. And so it's very hard to estimate in the aggregate how profitable this kind of external investment has been because the Chinese just don't provide numbers on this. But this bailout indicates a little bit of the scope of the problem, uh, that the deficit was $90 billion simply to keep these, uh, simply to keep these back solvent, you can see there the you know, rising debt levels of the uh, uh, Exim Bank. Of course, we've tried to defund our Exim Bank <laughs> completely. Uh, the Republicans in Congress have had this on their agenda for some time, so it's not as if we do this better. But uh, it indicates that you know, the, the health of these institutions is not uh, all that great. Um, right? So they got a $90 billion uh, policy uh, infusion all right, so conclusions. Chinese have a lot of advantages. They do these things quicker, uh, cheaper oftentimes uh, than Western institutions. Uh, because they've got this more relaxed um, attitude towards safeguards, you know, it confirms the original going in hypothesis uh, of the project. 
uh, but they have a lot of disadvantages. I would say mostly centering around their, their great overestimation of these external rates of return. Uh, they need to do a better job in actually calculating what the cost of entering into these projects will be. They've got a limited appreciation of political risk. I think that's what the Inga you know, DRC project uh, uh, illustrates. Uh, and the sustainability of the projects is less, you know, that's why you have safeguards in the first place. Uh, and so they really need to change that uh, regime. Uh, again, for the China specialists, there's some really interesting questions about corporate governance raised here because, you know, for example, how can you do a public-private partnership to build infrastructure when you know that the government is going to bail out any state-owned enterprise that's involved in one of these projects? Uh, that's the way you motivate people in Western countries, but those kinds of motives, incentives don't exist in China, and I just think it's a research question as to how, you know, how they manage that. Uh, for the West, uh, I think that we've designed a safeguards regime that is appropriate for um, developed countries, maybe not even for developed countries. I think they're a little bit too stringent even here uh, in the United States, uh, and so I think that um, that's got to be adjusted. The resource issue is, is killing us because uh, given American budget deficits, you know, we simply do not, and Congress is not willing to appropriate any new money uh, to pursue you know, this kind of uh, project. The World Bank has shifted back a little bit towards doing more infrastructure finance, but that's still a very, um, uh, you know, the amounts of money are minuscule by, by comparison to what China uh, has spent. Uh, the United States in particular has got a lot of problems in approaching this entire uh, problem. Uh, we don't have an Exim Bank standing behind our projects and we don't have any kind of central coordination. The Chinese policy banks basically act as the overall organizers. Now, one of the things we've learned in the project is that it's not, as, it's not a smoothly oiled machine, and so a lot of parts of the Chinese government actually fight with one another over a lot of the management and implementation of these projects. Nonetheless, compared to the United States, it is a well-oiled machine because we have no mechanism uh, for coordinating large, expensive, uh, complex projects like that. And I think that's something that uh, we need to do. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take, happy to take questions. <laughs>